Formula 3000 motor racing is a highly competitive international sport where the drivers race at speeds of up to 160 miles an hour. In the motor racing world, it's the stepping stone to Formula One, the ultimate goal for would-be racing champions, but only the very best make it. In 1988, all eyes were on Britain's Johnny Herbert, Formula 3000's most promising driver. Well, he was, the, he was the hot property of that year, obviously, and he was going to go places. And uh, You knew that he only had to give him half a chance with the equipment and the car, and he was going to bring the results for you. A lot of people were, were sort of behind me, and I was getting to that point. I was, I was getting very close to what I, I felt was being invincible. I was just so, so confident. I had great plans for him, and I could see that they were going to be severely affected. We were not at all sure whether we could save the left foot. You have this very sickening feeling this could be the end of his career. Johnny Herbert was only 10 years old when his racing talent was first recognised. He was good at karting. We used to race every week, near enough. And uh, it was just the thing that we thought, right, we'll get him into this because he enjoys it so much. Johnny Herbert into clearways for the last time, sawing away at the wheel, clipping that apex once more. By the time Johnny was just 24, he had many racing victories to his name. Champion of Formula Ford, Formula 3, and winner of his first Formula 3000 race at the start of the 1988 season. Five months later, Johnny had to win just one more race to clinch the Formula 3000 title, a win that he hoped would secure him a place in a leading Formula One team the following season. Well, I think the, the major thing with winning Brands Hatch was I was, I was part of the Benetton Junior team anyway for that year, but um, like for the prospects of Formula One, everybody was starting to, to notice me very, 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 very much so. I was looking for young drivers. Johnny Herbert had, had just confirmed all the, all the things that I was looking for. You know, there was exceptional talent, and that's what I wanted. On the front row, as the 26 stream away at the start of the 49 lap Formula 3000 race here at Brands Hatch in Kent. Very closely matched, but it's Herbert from Donnelly. Rest Johnny did a fantastic start, uh, led away. The only driver that was anywhere near close to him at that point was his teammates. Herbert on his own now. It was just going so Johnny well. Herbert. The race was just so easy for me. I was just so relaxed. It was about 12 seconds, I think, the lead I had. And the speed I was doing without really particularly trying was just much, much quicker than anybody else. So it was, it was basically, it was just mine. And for, for me, the championship was, you know, was, was on, the, on its way to, to England. There's Marino. Championship leader with three wins this season. And Marino squeezed out. Marino goes off at Paddock Bend. That's a mighty impact. Let's see it again. One corner, two corners, ripped off the car. Marino lucky to survive that one. Scrambling clear. Once the debris had been cleared, Johnny was back on the grid, trying to prepare himself mentally to regain his previous advantage. I suppose I was a bit sort of... Uh... Uh, upset about it because my race had gone so well in that first part that uh, my confidence was so high that I didn't really think there would be any other problems anyway and I'd still win the second one. So the race is restarted. I got a lot of wheel spin and didn't actually get as good a start as I did on the first one. But again, I wasn't really particularly concerned about it because I knew I'd be third or fourth into the first corner. We went down towards Druids, so I thought right now, Normally everything starts to settle down and spread out. Up the hill towards the hairpin, it's Donnelly, Martini challenging though. Johnny was actually trying to get ahead, he actually got ahead of Foytek going up onto the, the Grand Prix circuit, and then the incident happened. We were doing about 160, 165 miles an hour, and I could just see out the corner of my, my eye through the mirror that there was a car coming up the inside, but there was only room for half a car. We made contact, and the arm crew just came up just so quick. I just remember a lot of sort of banging. I remember my head being thrown around and the car spinning around and looking down and all the steering wheel had disappeared and I did that I must have gone through through my legs and out the front.
Miraculously, no one was killed in the crash. Most drivers were able to walk away from their cars. But Johnny was seriously injured. His legs had taken the full impact after the front of his car had been ripped away. We knew he was involved in it because his car didn't come back. People were saying, I remember somebody said, oh, don't worry, he's OK. Um, but we knew it was quite bad. We came over the lip of Pilgrim's Drop and it really was a scene of utter devastation. There were bits of cars everywhere, nose cones, wheels, bits of suspension. There was a marshal, in fact, in front of Johnny Herbert's car, indicating that they wanted us to stop at that car. OK, Johnny, the doctor's okay, here. Unconscious. No, he wasn't, doctor. OK, Johnny, got any pain in your neck? Good. Good. When he said that he had no pain in his neck, I assumed that he didn't have a broken neck, and I was therefore prepared to take his crash helmet off. Okay, okay, okay. can we get the face mask off? Yep. Can we have the oxygen? Okay, John, just going to give you some oxygen. That's with the breathing. Okay. And there's only pain here. It was quite obvious that he had very severe injuries to his ankles, which you could see quite easily by virtue of the fact that the feet were not pointing in the normal directions. The feeling I had was just a massive aching. It wasn't from like from the knee or the ankle. It was just there was just a, a very, very, very big ache, and it was just deep, and I just couldn't sort of do anything about it. I remember seeing a marshal actually look down, and I just saw him sort of cringe and sort of not be sick, but he was almost sick in front of me. So then I thought, well, things can't be too good. The way you sit is obviously your, your knees are bent. I couldn't see anything other than the top of my knees. My first thought was, I've lost my legs from, from the knee down. Am I warm? You're fine, Johnny. Let's have the end tonight. In the, as it were, the bad old days of the 60s, the common teaching was load and go. You loaded the casualty as quickly as possible, and you went to the hospital as quickly as possible. And very often, patients died in ambulances. We have since realized that the way to treat a driver is to stabilize him in the car, resuscitate him in the car, get on top of the injuries in the car. With Johnny's injury, with lower leg injuries, it's possible to lose as much as two-thirds of your blood uh, into the tissues. If the blood loss is great and the blood pressure plummets to very low levels, that is a life-threatening situation, and that's what we wanted to avoid at all costs. And therefore, it's essential that you give fluids to replace the blood that may not necessarily be outside the body, but which is not where it should be in the vascular system. Johnny's team manager, Trevor Foster, didn't see the accident. He was in the pit lane when it happened. You in charge? Yes. Did you see what happened? Yeah, he lost control and spun into the arm cup. Over the years, you do right. see huge Sorry. accidents in motorsport. But every now and then, there are those which, you know, take your breath away, and this was certainly one of them. My biggest concern was the damage to Johnny's legs. The injuries obviously looked pretty major, and you know how crucial it is for a driver with his feet and his legs, and you have this very sickening feeling inside you where you feel the chances that this could be the end of his career. We were fearful that there was no circulation going to the feet. And therefore, it was essential to straighten his legs out. But that, as you could imagine, is a very painful thing to do. And we therefore had to, using an intravenous painkiller, and we were using diamorphine, which is very powerful indeed. But even so, we had to give quite a large dose to bring the pain under control. OK, Mark, straighten the legs. That's fine. That's good, Jenny. That's fine. It took 40 minutes to stabilize him. Despite the enormous damage to his car, he didn't have to be cut free. It was going to be very uh, traumatic for him and painful to remove from the car like that. And also, he was calling out, put me out, put me out. And indeed, I thought that was very sound advice, and that's exactly what I do for him. Johnny was taken to Queen Mary's Hospital, Sidcup. There, doctors began to assess the full extent of his injuries. OK, darling. All right, we're just going to cut your sock off now, pet. OK. Right, well, frankly, I didn't think that he would drive a racing car again. And at that stage, we were not at all sure as to whether we could save the left foot. 
you can see that the, the toes of the left foot should be in alignment with the hind foot over here. This foot is completely dislocated sideways and outwards. This bone here, the main bone, is broken through. That's a very serious fracture. The most important uh, thing that was done was to clean the wound, remove all the debris. The dislocated joints were realigned, and they, both feet were then immobilized in a plaster cast. Okay. When I woke up for the first time in the hospital, that was when I realized that my, my legs were still attached. So uh, everything was still still together. So if they're still together, then I'll try as hard as I can to uh, to still do the dream that I've always wanted. You could tell that he was uh, he was in a lot of pain, but uh, all the time it was just he was so confident in he was going to get back to driving again. And uh, I mean that is all we wanted for him really because that was his life. But Johnny needed to convince Formula One's Benetton manager, Peter Collins, that he was still able to drive and win. Well, I really went to seem to, to, to find out whether psychologically there'd been any damage to his attitude towards racing. We had a little chat and then he, he made a comment. Do you remember anything about the accident? Well, I remember it wasn't my fault. I mean, I know it wasn't my fault. And what he was really saying, well, it was a racing accident. He didn't make a, a fundamental driving error, which resulted in the accident. So his confidence about what he could do in a racing car wasn't affected. And that was a very important issue. You know, I mean, I've got... Johnny had just four months to prove that he was still capable of driving and racing. The target for a test for Johnny was going to be December. I had no doubt that if Johnny didn't recover quickly, if he wasn't active again quickly, then you wouldn't see a return. Well, we've got to get you out of here. Now, I know someone in Austria, and they can get you fit for this test in December. Fantastic. I mean, that's, that's, that's all I want to hear, you know. I was getting a very positive vibe from Peter, and that, that goal of being a Formula One driver was still there, so I had something to aim for. Oh, I know I can do it. I can't wait. Yeah, I know. I was taking risks, for sure. Um, there were very few, if any, drivers available, fully fit, who had as much skill as Johnny had. Six weeks after the accident, Peter Collins arranged for Johnny to visit Austria for specialist treatment. OK, Johnny, trust me. The hospital wouldn't do this, but this is the way we have to go, and I'm sure it's the right way. In Austria, sports physiotherapist Tony Mathis began treating Johnny using unconventional techniques. Oh. Ah, Johnny is a nice feeling, okay. The first thing is when I saw Johnny, I put the plaster off and then it was clear for me, we have to do different treatment from the hospital. We have to start to be active treatments, but this, uh, we have to work millimeters for millimeters, more movement in the leg. Okay. We start this morning with the acupuncture to stop the pain a bit in the, uh, in the ankle. I was worried that the plaster had come off too so. soon because the blood supply to the bone was critical. If the blood supply had been damaged, that bone would have disintegrated and the fracture wouldn't have healed. It was clear we never can fix this ankle 100%, but we need about 50% of its movement to work on the clutch. When we have 50%, it's enough for Formula One. We did a lot of work with uh, the, the toes to actually straighten them out, and it was quite excruciating to actually have that pain because it, uh, it hurt like hell, I must admit. Alex, Alex, don't think about further pain, Alex. The manipulation was important to feel when the pain comes, you know? And so every morning you see is going one centimeter more and a bit more and a bit more, and then is the point you must stop. They started to put me in the swimming pool and actually make me work and I could actually just walk, walk on my toes because obviously the body gets much, much lighter. And that was, that was quite good for me. He also did a thing to me which I, I hated because I think that hurt the most out of everything I did was uh, I'd have my training shoes on. He did actually make me climb up a big, big, big hill and that, that really hurt, really hurt. 
And then he came. I'd always go to bed sort of so fed up with it that I just, that was it. I just didn't want to do it anymore. I was just totally, oh, my body was tired. I was just mentally just fed up by doing the same thing every single day. Some evenings he was really tired and, you know, have a bit of water in the eyes and said, Tony, can we just stop a little bit? It's like, no, we have only one chance. In December, you have to sit in the car. I think this was a 180% change of, of Johnny Herbert. You know, before it was everything easy. He was getting in the car and he win. So now he have pain and only one chance. He lost a lot of this young boy's jokes, you know. After this time, he was a man. Hey, Johnny. Hey, good to hear from you. How's things? Well, the immediate target was to get him behind the wheel again. And the sooner he drove, the, the easier it would be for me to, to continue the assessment of whether my judgment was correct or not. Listen, I want to get you back in the car as soon as possible. I'm going to go ahead and arrange some car practice for you. Uh-huh. Maybe two weeks. Peter had an idea of taking me uh, uh, carting in Butmore Park in, uh, in Kent, and I thought it was probably a very good idea because uh, it would just give me that sort of feeling of, of, of driving again. You just watch me that side. It was something that uh, obviously I was very nervous about, and uh, I think my biggest concern was actually not crashing the thing, especially head on, and then doing some more damage. Ooh. Because there's no suspension, it was actually very bouncy, and my left foot was actually still quite sensitive, but it was just that mental thing of getting over the first time to drive. It was a bit sort of, I think, calm and took my time to actually build up the speed. But uh, within, I would say, five laps, all, all that fear was completely gone. I was very pleased that it, it, it had gone well and that it had confirmed he still had the, the skills to, to drive a racing vehicle quickly. It wasn't as much relief about, well, yeah, you know, he can do the job, I was right. It was more, OK, let's move on to the next step. That's. That's another hurdle, we're over. That was brilliant. Oh, fantastic. Whew. Oh. Uh, I had a call and said, oh, well, you know, Johnny's back to his normal self. He, he spun three times in a straight line and continued intentionally on a wet track. To be able to do that, you've got to have very good orientation of where you are on the track. But for me, that was, that was an, an unnecessary risk, but it was also very typically Johnny. But it, it reaffirmed in a confidence and the belief in what he could do. Peter organised a, a monocoque, which is just the chassis part, with uh, some pedals, the steering wheel, and some very, very heavy, heavy springs. It was pushing these pedals for about an hour, an hour and a half, trying to build up the calf muscle and the strength, and also trying to overcome the sensitivity of the feet. It was very, very painful once again, and it was whatever I did, everything was just pain all the time, but it was very, a very important thing to do, because when the test was coming up in December, at least I had an idea of roughly what I was going to be going through. I remember getting changed in the back of the truck, and uh, then sort of collecting my sticks and sort of walking out to the car. And, uh, you know, all those feelings sort of slowly started to come back. Will I be able to do it? not be able to do it? I was on my own. There we go. until you're comfortable when you feel like going fast, go fast. And he went around did about three laps very slowly. Had to do a lot better than that. It was mainly the left foot was, uh, was, was hurting quite a bit, breaking quite a lot. And after a couple of laps of pushing the pedal, it just seemed to sort of numb it down and calm it down. I felt absolutely at home with the thing. But I thought, well, I think I'll give a little bit of a, a wind up to Peter when I come back in. Yeah, it feels like the car's driving me. It's, it's just not happening. He had this really uh, pained look 
in his eyes and said, oh, I can't do it. I could just see on his face that he was very, very, very nervous and worried about it. I said, but I'll, I'll give it another go. And I sort of went about five seconds quicker than what I'd gone before. What was that, Johnny? You weren't too much, Pete. I was only winding you up. I remember it easily, not an easy thought, really. You swine, you really had me on that one. Feel fine. Everything felt fine. That was, uh, was fantastic. That mental thing of not having that fear anymore was just pressure because they'd sort of taken a driver on who was uh, disabled, almost. And they basically needed a performance from me. I was obviously very nervous, got a, got a great start, and then the, the race just panned out for me. When I actually did the first lap, it was a, a very big bump uh, going onto the back straight. And I, the only way I could do it was to actually just leave my left foot like floating around in the car. You'd hit this bump and it would hurt like hell. In the 60-lap race, a grueling 180 miles, Johnny was determined to succeed. I just pushed myself to the limit the whole way through, and I had to do it that way. It was the only way that I was really going to survive. It's Nigel Mansell's magnificent victory, win in second place, Alain Prost. In third position, Mauricio Gutermann. A magnificent fourth place in his first Grand Prix, Johnny Herbert in the Benetton Four. There are very few totally fit and healthy drivers who do that in their first Grand Prix. It was just absolutely a dream come true because I'd worked so, so hard to actually just, just to be able to drive the thing. I think everybody was just absolutely gobsmacked that I'd actually done, done that well. The moment after the race when I first saw Johnny and the satisfaction was, was probably one of the greatest things I've ever experienced. I mean, we were just so thrilled and, you know, when it finished, you realised uh, what, a, what he'd done, actually. Um, it was amazing, really. But as the 1989 season continued, Johnny's performance deteriorated. More difficult circuits proved too much of a challenge. I think Rio was a circuit where you, you really don't use the brakes a great deal, and we immediately went on to other circuits, Imola, Monaco, where largely because of his, uh, his lack of leg strength, that really just uh, limited him what he could achieve. The knives were out with Benetton and with certain individuals at Benetton, and it was only a matter of time before he was, uh, as they put it, rested, which is another word for being removed. It was, it was very upsetting because, you know, I, I think I had a cry, obviously, when it first came. But then it, I think it then started to sink in that it was really the best thing for me because I wasn't doing myself any justice in, in the driving itself at that point. Johnny now had no choice. Dropped from the team, he began an intense period of physiotherapy with Christina Winkup. Psychologically, he was, he was very low and you know, there were times when he had to be pushed to do more, to go through the pain barrier, to, uh, you know, achieve. Over the next five years, Johnny persevered with his fitness, driving cars both here and in Japan. In 1995, he rejoined the Benetton Formula One team without much success until the British Grand Prix at Silverstone. The race went well. I got into third position, and Damon and Michael were having their battle at the battle at the front. Oh, what's happened? Damon's lost it, has he? They're both off. It's Schumacher. They're both off. They're both out. But the result is, of course, that Johnny Herbert is leading the British Grand Prix. It probably took me about a lap or two before I'd actually realised that I was actually in the lead of the, of the British Grand Prix. Because they just disappeared, I just hadn't put two and two together. I can always remember the feelings in the last couple of laps, just thinking about everything that had gone on before. The accident where I'd worked so hard of getting into Formula One. 
then having the disappointment at the end of the Benetton in 89, then to get back in, and I was always fighting all the time to get back. And Johnny Herbert is on his last lap. He's been the British car champion. He's won the Formula Ford Festival. He was the British Formula 3 champion in Eddie Jordan's team. He suffered all sorts of adversities, including those two dreadfully shattered legs. But the glorious winner of the British Grand Prix, Johnny Herbert. All the flags were waving, and it was just a fantastic, fantastic moment, and it was something that I just will never, ever forget. I ran the whole straight of Silverstone, not realising how long that is, and I said to the chap, I've got to get over there, I'm Johnny's mum, I've got to get over to see him, and by the time I've got over the bridge and into the pits, because they get them out of the car so quickly. It finished, the podium had gone, so I missed it all. But it was it was just such a lovely feeling running, and I had other people running with me, and I could see all these people running the other way with the Johnny Herbert T-shirts on, want to come and congratulate us. But no, it was it was marvellous, marvellous for him. So excited. <laughs> I think it's an amazing achievement to have done what he's done. And to me, it's, it's, um, it's a statement of what could have been without the accident, without losing the momentum of his career. Johnny has continued to race in Formula One, and in 1999, he joins the Stewart team, ever optimistic of winning the World Championship. Johnny Herbert still still after that dream that he always he always set himself when he was uh, when he was karting and to be a world champion is something I'm still working hard to be so uh, you know I'm going to give it everything I've got to actually do that and there's no reason why I can't if I get in the right situation More real stories next Friday at 8.30. But next tonight on BBC One, the fashion fads of the past 10 years.